as the lepers went, they were healed of their leprosy. So we're going to continue to pray for Kelly because she's recovering and she's going to recover quickly. And uh, that's the way it's going to be. And um, so, but I'm glad that that surgery is over and I'm looking forward to seeing the good things that God does in it. So, all right. Well, today we're going to be talking about baptism of the Holy Spirit for two reasons. Number one, uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit is, is we're going to pray for people today to, um, if there's anybody that hasn't been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And the second reason is, is if you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, which most of you here probably are, you need to be able to communicate that to folks. And secondly, giving you the confidence to know that um, God um, moves in power as a result of that. You know, Acts chapter 1 verse 8 um, says, you know, that, um, actually, let me just read it real quick. Well, that's ahead of my notes. But anyway, I'll get to it when I get to it. But anyway, it's in the middle of my notes. But basically when uh, Jesus said, don't do anything until um, the baptism of, uh, till the baptism comes, till you're filled with power from on high. And that Greek word for power means miraculous, m- miracles. A lot of people don't realize that Greek doesn't need adjectives. One of the reasons that um, I believe that Greek was the language that um, God used in the Bible was is because it's incredibly colorful. You know, if I'm going to, in English, I could describe Nigel a lot like you would describe myself. He doesn't have any hair. He's not wearing purple. Praise Jesus for that. I have got that going on today. But there are a lot of different words to describe Nigel. But they were, a Greek, in the Greek, it would be one word that meant everything. No need adjectives. So different words that may, whatever, that may be translated in English as the same are actually different. So there's actually six translations in the Bible of the word power. This one in particular means the ability to do miraculous works. So um, baptism of the Holy Spirit is really important because the Bible talks that as a result of that, you are filled with power from on high to do the miraculous. And the miraculous is important. I think that sometimes churches in general have shied away from signs and wonders because <clears throat> maybe Well, one thing's for sure, you want to make sure that it's not all about signs and wonders. It's all about God, period, right? But as a result of having God in your life, there is these signs and wonders. In the book of Acts, the Bible talks about how, (coughs) excuse me, signs and wonders speak, amen? And so having that power of the Holy Spirit is really important. Now, I, I want to talk to you really quickly about my background and then get into the message. I grew up in a lot of different churches that didn't believe in baptism in the Holy Spirit. I was... (coughs) excuse me, incredibly pessimistic about it. Um, And actually, Phil could probably attest to this because we went to high school together. And a lot of times, I thought Phil was nuts (laughs) with some of the things that he believed, you know what I'm saying? Um, But as as I got into college, um, I I began to hear more about baptism of the Holy Spirit. And um, I'd never heard it before uh, until um, my pastor, who actually started this church many, many years ago, Pastor Rob, invited me to his house and asked me, um, if I had ever been baptized in the Holy Spirit. I'd never heard the words baptized in the Holy Spirit. I've heard of being baptized in water, and I'd heard of the gift of tongues and how like, bad it was. I mean, I was told constantly that it was like of the devil. It wasn't good. We don't do that. And so, plus I had seen a lot of um, things happen that maybe weren't good. I had seen people push people over when they were praying for them, and it discouraged me, and, and I wanted um, my faith, obviously, to be real. So, past, I had been praying um, in college because I was a music major, thinking about maybe becoming a ministry major, but my, my prayer to the Lord was, is I don't want to pastor a dead church. I want a church that's alive, you know, and so anyway, Pastor Rob gave me a call when I was home um, from uh, college for, I think it was a weekend or so, and, and my girlfriend, Amy, who uh, obviously is Pastor Amy, we went over to his house, and he began to talk to me about baptism in the Holy Spirit. And I was like, I'd never seen these scriptures before, never, never seen them before in my life, and never seen them in the light of what he had shared with me, and began to talk to me about baptism in the Holy Spirit. And then he said, well, what do you think about praying with me and, and about that? And um, my first thought was I got afraid. I was afraid. Because seed that had been put in me from my past, from other churches, was in there. And he immediately picked up on that. He said, you know, Jeff, if you, if you ask God for fish, he's going to give you fish. If you ask God for bread, 
He's going to give you bread. If you can't ask God for anything evil, and he's going to give you something evil, it's just not the way it works. If you're uncomfortable, you know, we don't have to pray now, and you can. I said, no, I want to pray, and Amy was there with me, and he said, well, when I pray, you'll begin to feel like um, just this rising in here, and I'm like, what is that, you know, and, and, and he said, if you just open up your mouth when you're done, when we're, uh, we're praying, he says, you'll begin to speak in tongues. He says, when you get baptized the Holy Spirit, it, it comes with tongues. You may not um, the prayer tongue. You may not um, speak it right away. It might not manifest right away in your life, but it's in there, and it will manifest as you have faith. Well, we began to pray, and that's exactly what happened. <laughs> right here, I started feeling, you know, something. I'd never experienced it before. Rising up, I got here, and I thought, this is nuts. This is nuts. I'm not doing this. and just, you know, swallowed it, you know, and Amy did the same, but there was something that happened that night. Something happened that night. So anyway, um, we, uh, from that point on, it was like God launched me into some awesome, crazy experiences that, when I say crazy, I don't mean crazy, crazy, I mean just like way outside the box. Things that I'd longed to see, that I wanted to see so much, I began to see. I had a um, keyboard that I had bought, cost me a lot of money, thousands of dollars, and uh, I needed to pay that off, and so I was looking in the newspaper, and I found uh, a... a a uh, church called, um, I can't remember the name of the church, doesn't, whatever, but anyway, and uh, they said that we'll pay you $75 to play for a two-hour two hour practice, and I think it was a two-hour service. I'm like, 75 bucks to play for four hours? Are you kidding me? Psh, absolutely. So I signed up. Well, I signed up. There's this Holy Ghost-filled, crazy, awesome, love Jesus, let's see the miracles of God church. That's what I signed up for. I had no idea that I was being put into that, you know? And uh, I just saw awesome stuff happen. There's nothing that you could ever explain. I remember one time in particular, I was playing keyboards even here, very worshipful, you know. And um, all of a sudden, uh, the pastor gets up and he says, hey, God's anointing to heal is here. And there were a lot of people at the church, you know, in a small room. And, and they all lined up, like like. 10 or 15, maybe even 20 people lined up. You know how people pray, you know, be healed, be healed. He, he got at the altar and he just began to run down the altar. Be healed in the name of Jesus. And, and I'm, I'm not kidding, I could hear something. Like I heard a coming. I'm like, what is that sound? And people were just like, and this wind came and, it, and, he, and he hit me. And I, I was playing my keyboard and I fell on my keyboard like that. I'm like, oh my gosh, what just happened? You know, and I'm watching the sound men in the back trying to mute channels because all you can hear is all the piano keys playing at the same time. I'm like, that's amazing. All these people get up and they're all healed. I'm like, are you kidding me? I've never seen anybody healed right away. Like, I'd never seen, I mean, my mom had been healed, you know, of some things, but I'd never seen, like, just somebody that I didn't know in a church service like that get healed. I was like, oh, my gosh. Just started seeing stuff that was just absolutely amazing. And then Amy calls me, um... And she says, hey, I was uh, at, the house, uh, at the apartment, and I started praying in tongues. And I was instantly jealous. Can you believe that? I was jealous. I really was. I was like, oh, my gosh. I've been seeking to pray in tongues so long, and she gets it first. I mean, I was young. Give me some grace. You know, I was like, why, why? I'm the head of the house. I should, you know, all this stuff and all this stuff. This stupid, stupid, stupid stuff. And one night I was working at a, I worked at a radio station overnight in uh, Rochester, um, 102.7 FM, and I was out there working overnight. About 2 o'clock came, 2.30. I'm like, Lord, I give up. I just said, give up. I'm going to let go of all this fear, and I'm just going to let you move through me. And I did, and I began to pray in tongues. And that night, I think the whole night, I just prayed in the Spirit. There was nobody else in the radio station, so it was good. <laughs> Those are the types of stuff that I began to see. Some pretty One other uh, thing that happened that was pretty amazing is I began to learn about hunger, about how hunger is important. And uh, we were, I was used to having, you know, you have an hour service. That's how long service you have an hour. You get in at 11, um, you get out at noon. And, you know, the preacher preaches 15 minutes and that's it. I wasn't used to having long services. So we have this special service, starts at 6.30, and I'm playing keyboards. And I look at the, 7.30, 8.30, 9.30, 10.30, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm exhausted. My arms are aching because I'm keeping them up in the air. And God is just doing awesome stuff, you know. And I start to feel the Holy Spirit just kind of come down, you know. And I watched this, this little, little old lady in the second row right where Mary Ann's sitting. And I watched her look around, and then she goes, 
the presence of God hit again. We didn't leave till close to midnight. I learned something, you know. So that's why I'm so passionate about this, because this changed my life radically, okay? Let's start out by looking at Luke 4, 18 through 19. Luke 4, 18 through 19. All right, and it says there, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Pay special attention to a couple of things there. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Somebody say, upon me. Now, this is Jesus speaking. So Jesus is speaking. He's saying, listen, there's a reason that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. There's a reason that I'm anointed. And then he goes forth and he says, why? To preach the gospel to the poor, heal the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to sever liberty those who are oppressed, and proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. We are baptized in the Holy Spirit, and we are anointed and gifted for a reason. Amen? When the Spirit of God begins to flow, something always happens. Something happens. There's a reason that he is there. Now, we know that the Spirit of God, but there's a difference between the Spirit of God coming in us and the Spirit of God coming upon us. I'm going to show you in your word. So if you have your Bible, follow closely with me. We've got them up on the screen to help you also. So when you get saved and you become born again, the Spirit of God it beco- comes in you, okay? You have now Jesus, fa- the Father God, and the Holy Spirit are one. Somebody say one. So when he comes in, they all three in one come together, okay? And the Bible says in Ephesians 1, 13 through 14, it says, And you were also included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So when we get saved, the Holy Spirit comes in us. Somebody say comes in us. Um, the Bible says in John 3, 3, Jesus said, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you become born again, Um, you cannot see the kingdom of God. So how many here are saved? You know Jesus is your personal Lord and Savior. Amen. How many guys have been baptized in water? Amen. Awesome. Okay, so that's what that's talking about there. But there's also something, and I'm going to start with Jesus, and I'm going to move to the disciples and show you some examples of the difference between being baptized in water and being baptized in the Spirit, the Spirit of God coming in you and the Spirit of God coming upon you, starting with the baptism of Jesus in Matthew three, sixteen. It says, when he had been baptized, this is water, somebody say water, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. You're going to hear that a lot today. It's all over uh, these, these scriptures, upon him, okay? So this is where Jesus was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Jesus did not um, uh, start his ministry until after he was baptized in water and then filled with the Spirit. I know we can go back and forth about Jesus being fully God and fully man, but Jesus is setting the tone and setting the example for us. Somebody say yes. Isn't it great that Jesus never expects us to do something that he would never do? (laughs) Amen? All right, good. So he lays that out. So then um, you can see that the the disciples were baptized in the Spirit. If you go to Acts 1.8, which is what I talked about earlier, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it says, And you shall receive power, which is miraculous power, the power to do the miraculous, when the Holy Spirit has come, Upon you. Interesting. Weren't the disciples already saved? Absolutely. They were already saved. So why, if they're already saved, is Jesus making us such a big deal of another experience to wait in Jerusalem? He says, wait in Jerusalem. Don't do anything until the Spirit of God comes upon you. Did Jesus do anything before the Spirit of God came upon him? No. So he tells the disciples the same thing. And he says... And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. 
I don't have time to go there, but we've been talking about it on Fridays. In the book of Acts, you see it over and over again. Um, the disciples going off and doing miracles and people getting saved as a result of it. Over and over and over again. And because, and Paul even said it in 1 Corinthians, I believe it was chapter 2. You can Google it. He said, you know, I didn't come to you with persuasive words, right, or elegant words, but I came to you with a demonstration of the Holy Spirit. So that your faith would not be in men, but your faith would be in the power of God. And that's why miraculous signs are so important. Because it helps people to see past us, knowing that it could never be us. I can't even say that. It sounds so whatever. But that it's God, because God does the miraculous. Amen? So the Sumerians, they, Sumerians, the Sumerians, it's a new word, Sumerians. Um, Samaritans. <laughs> Samaritans. Um, uh, this happens in Acts 8, 14 through 17, another example. Now, when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and, Jane, and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they may receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had, already been, they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. So you can see they got saved. And after that, they said, we don't, that was like me. Like if, if they came to me and they, and, and they talked about that, I was like, well, I've heard of baptism of, the Holy, of, of water, but I have never heard of baptism of the Holy Spirit. See, I was saved, but I had not been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Story of Cornelius in Acts 10, 44 through 46. Now this, what happened here is people got saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit almost at the exact same time. It says there, well, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon, did you see the word there? Fell upon, interesting. All those who heard the word and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished. As many as came with Peter because of the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Amen? So what I want to call your attention to is that the Holy Spirit has come upon us for a reason. And we're going to talk about those reasons today. Remember, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and be witnesses. Amen? We're talking about Lord of the Harvest. We're talking about people getting saved. We're talking about prodigals coming home. And God wants to use signs and wonders to do that. He can use other things. He can use conversations with people. But this is one way that he does that. Amen? All right. So, let's see here. Take a look at this, Acts 4, 13 through 22. This one is on the fly. It just came up in my spirit. So you don't, uh, I don't think you have that one. And if you do, well, thanks for following Jesus. <laughs> okay? And when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men. Okay? So, um, Peter and John are getting in trouble for doing something horrible. They healed somebody. Everybody gasped like Pastor Dennis just did. <sighs> okay? They healed somebody. And, they're, boy, they're in big trouble. They just got pulled into the principal's office, and it's about to go down. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. So they said, okay, wait, listen. There's a miraculous sign that happened. These are uneducated men. They've been with Jesus. You see the connection there? See, they're... The witness there was in the demonstration of the Spirit, not by the word that they spoke, although that could have happened too. That they took notice of, listen, Mike's just an ordinary dude. Jeff's just an ordinary guy. Holly's just an ordinary person, right? But she's been with Jesus. But he's been with Jesus. But Lori, she's been with Jesus. Well, how do they know that they've been with Jesus? Because of what happened. What happened spoke to the Jews. So, so what they want to do is they want to shut this down, and this is what they say. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. 
You can't say anything against a miracle. If you go up to somebody and you pray for them to be healed in the name of Jesus, and they get healed in the name of Jesus, they can't say it didn't happen. They can't argue with your witness. Listen, Diane has been with Jesus. I can see that. Stu has been with Jesus. I can see that. Amen? Hallelujah. See, the, the flow of the Spirit in doing the miraculous, in doing the things of God, point people to Jesus, the fact that you're with them. And so they say, well, if Caroline is with Jesus, I want to be with Jesus too. If Patrick is with Jesus and he has these things happening in his life, wow, I want to be with Jesus too. You see, the world is looking for God. They just don't know it yet. Even if you can talk to an atheist, you can talk to an agnostic, you can talk to the various cults, they're all looking for contentment, peace. They're looking for something. They just don't realize the only place they can find it is in Jesus. But you know that, don't you? So when Connie prays for somebody and they get healed, or Connie prays something and she says something that nobody else could possibly know, Oh my gosh, there's peace in Connie that I want. There's something in Lori that I want. She's been with Jesus. I want want to be with Jesus too. That's not even in my notes, but thank you, Lord, for... And I'll go back, listen to the tape, and teach myself and take notes on it. And I just took my keyboard and flipped it over here. Fix it later. Uh, (laughs) um, Okay, so... Go back to that scripture. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they commanded them to go aside out, aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For indeed, there is a notable miracle has been done through them, and it's evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them. And from now on, they speak to no man in this name. No more. Don't talk about Jesus. No more talking about Jesus. No more healing people. Amen? What would happen if every church in the city, right, was filled with such power of the Lord that people were getting healed every day? What would happen? What would happen? Like, I'm just, I'm not feeling well. I've been praying. I'm not sure why. I'm going to go down to the Presbyterian church and let them pray with me. What would happen if we all, listen, we, sometimes we get sidetracked too, and that's why I'm talking about this. Amen? Um, people being healed and miraculous signs shouldn't be something that happens every once in a while. It should be something that happens daily, every day in the community center, somebody gets healed. Every day the church doors are open, somebody receives a word of knowledge. Every day a demon is cast out or somebody who is pressed is set free. Every day that should be happening in the church. And it's not happening in the churches. Churches are dead. There's no miracles that are happening there. Why? The devil went after it. He stole their faith. And he's trying to steal theirs now too. So he can't talk about Jesus anymore. And this is their response. So they called them and commanded them not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, (laughs) threatened them, with what? (laughs) Threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people since they all glorified God for what had been done. For the man was over 40 years old of this miracle being happening and performing. Amen? So we talked about the difference between being baptized in the Holy Spirit and just being baptized in water. So what's the result? Well, what did the Holy Spirit coming upon Jesus, what did the anointing cause Jesus to do? See, the Spirit of God should move us. But a lot of times we're not moved by the Spirit. We're moved by other things. I was, uh, yesterday morning, it was a beautiful morning, got on the front porch. I love my front porch. Nice breeze coming through, my coffee, and I'm studying about something completely different. I'm thinking, boy, this is really good, this is really good. And then my iPad goes, ding! It's a Facebook from someone. I thought, well, I'll just quick reply. And before you know it, I'm scrolling through my news feed. It's been a half an hour, like, oh my gosh! I have been completely distracted. God was talking to me from, about stuff. <laughs> completely distracted. Amen? That's what we do if we're not careful, right? See, it's like this. 
if you get a, 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 took a ship and you stuck it in the middle of the ocean and you put its sails up and the wind comes, do you think the ship's going to move? Absolutely. If we would just allow the Holy Spirit to move us, instead of trying, just relaxing, trusting him, what would happen if we just let the Holy Spirit move us? What would we do? These are the things we would do. He says, preach the gospel to the poor. That's the first thing he says. Well, <clears throat> first of all, he's not just preaching the gospel to the poor because that's not just what he's referring to. Because not just the poor need Jesus, but the rich need Jesus too. The upper class, the middle class, the upper lower middle class, the lower upper middle class, the lower upper little. It, we all need it. It has nothing to do with how much money we do or don't have. We all need Jesus. But what he's talking about here is not a physical poor, but a spiritual poor. Okay? Have you guys ever been in want? I have. When I first got back from college, I remember sitting up at the seats at Community Action looking to get some help. I remember going down to the Department of Social Services, getting food stamps. It was tough because I didn't want to be on food stamps, but I had to. I was working two jobs. It still wasn't enough. I know what it's like to not have enough. I know what it's like to <laughs> get in the car, the, it, it, this little blue car we had, look at the gas, and it's like below empty, and we got to go up on the hill, and I'm thinking, we're not going to make it. I remember going through the couch. I remember going through my jeans. I remember going just gathering, you know, three bucks worth of gas. Now, back then, you could fill a car up for 10 bucks, okay? But at three bucks, I'm like, oh, yes, you know, and fill the car. I barely had enough to even make it up to church. I know what that's like, right? But I knew that, listen, uh, that's where I am right now, and, and I need more to support my family. Well, being spiritually poor is understanding that, listen, I am in spiritual need. I cannot live without Jesus. He is my spiritual bread. I live off of every word that comes off of his mouth. That's what feeds myself spiritually. Amen? Um, you know, the Bible talks about the Beatitudes, about that. It says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall what? Anybody remember? Receive the kingdom of God. Close. It might be be filled too, but there's one translation that says, I think it's blessed are hunger and thirst for righteousness, they shall be filled with righteousness. But, but there, the one is here. He says, so if you know that you're spiritually poor, well, then that's a good thing because you know that you need Jesus. Jesus said, listen, I didn't come for people who are healthy. I came for people who are sick. I came for people who need a doctor. I came for people who need a God. I didn't come for people who don't need a God. I came for people that realize that they are poor spiritually and that they need God. Amen? And so that's what God has called us to do, to look for people who are spiritually hungry and feed them the Word of God. Somebody say, yeah. yeah. Amen? You know, in the kingdom of God, I mean, think about that. Um, in, John, in Matthew 3, verse 2, John the Baptist says, repent, for the kingdom of God is near. Well, what does he mean by the kingdom of God is near? Well, Jesus is coming. The kingdom of God is near. Amen? Amen? Jesus is the entrance in the kingdom of God. In Luke 10, 9, Jesus said this to people who were going to heal the sick. He says, heal the sick who are, who are there and tell them, when you heal them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Amen? As I say, Holly wasn't saved. I know she's saved. Praise Jesus and Pastor Roger's grateful too. Right? But if she wasn't, do you know how the kingdom of God would come near to her? Because Jesus is in me. He's already near. He's in Kathy. Amen? So the poor in spirit realize that people that know that they are in need, the kingdom of God will come near because they're poor in spirit. How many guys think there are a lot of people in the world that are poor in spirit? Amen. Good. Moving on to the next point. Number two, heal the brokenhearted. Is there anyone around you that you know is brokenhearted? Sitting on my front porch. Front porch leads to all sorts of discussions with people that, that go by. Because me and Amy are always like, hey, how you doing? Hey, how you doing? And then they eventually make their way up to the sidewalk, and we start new relationships that way. Well, I'm up there one uh, morning about a month ago. It was a nice day. Young, young kid comes up, drunk off his whatever, 
kid, 25, 26. He's got this song. He says, you got to hear this song. And he played this song for me on his phone. And tears began to stream from his eyes. He said, I'm so hurt. I'm so broken. And I don't know what to do. And he said, well, I believe that God loves you. I hope so. I tried to talk to him some more. And he just, he didn't receive Jesus that day. He walked off my front porch with tears in his eyes. Broken hearted. They, we are everywhere. I don't know if there's a worse thing than being broken hearted. Do you think there's a lot of people in the world who are broken hearted? Third, Jesus says there, he's anointed me to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Is there anyone around us who is oppressed? God has anointed us to help set them free by preaching the gospel to them. I don't know. The word anointed, you know what that means? It means you're gifted in it. If you're a Christian, not only can you do it, but you are specially gifted for it. Amen? As uh, I can't remember, I don't can't remember, I really want to remember, but it's the show that's on TV, and it's this comedian, and he brings up little kids that have talent. Steve Harvey, love that show. Big little Big Shot. This kid, little kid comes up. You know, boys filled with the Holy Spirit. He comes up, he's talking to Steve Harvey. Steve Harvey's like, so you're a praise and worship leader. He says, yeah, I'm a praise and worship leader. And he says, well, why don't you lead the crowd in praise and worship? He says, all right. He gets off. He comes, check it out on Facebook. Gets off, gets down, starts, everybody's going with it. He starts praising and worshiping God. That little boy, he's got to be maybe four or five or six, is anointed to lead worship. And he knows it. You are anointed to lead people to Jesus, but you don't know it yet. You are. You're anointed. You're specially gifted in it. Because it's God in you flowing. Somebody say, yeah. And it says, recovery of sight to the blind. Have you ever been deceived? I've been. And when we're deceived, we don't even know that we're deceived. That's why, what's what it comes from. Do you know anybody that thinks they're on their way to heaven but are heading straight for hell right now? You know anybody that thinks that, that the, their lifestyle is going to lead them to a better place, but you can see it's just going to end up in another drug recovery program? Just another place in jail? Do you know anybody that's like that? Oh, yeah, we do, don't we? Amen. All right? Jesus says, we're anointed to preach recovery of sight to the blind. You know, there's certain people that when I just hang out with them, their anointing helps me to see. You know what I'm saying? It's like when I'm with Pastor Tim in Rochester, there is no doubt in my mind that God wants to Help people have an abundance of money to be a blessing to others. It's his anointing. It's what he preaches. That's a big part of what he does. Had a $1.6 or $7 million building given to him. Amen? Has a business that continues to flourish. Takes 40%. Took more in the beginning of the ministry and ties it every single week. People are like, oh, rich people. Yeah, he's rich, but you know what? He's given a whole lot more than I could ever give. There's nothing wrong with having money. The problem is money having you. But when I'm near him, I can feel it. I'm like, oh, my God. When I'm near him, it's like when we were believing God for this building or any building, when we didn't even have any hope of any building, right, we had a, a board meeting, okay? And we had some consultants in there to help us, you know, with our budget and to help us potentially get ready to go into a building. This was a few years ago. And um, they, they kind of not really the best attitude there. They're like, well, you know what, they just, they just, they just don't have the money. And, and, uh, and Pastor Tim, who's on the phone in Rochester, interrupts her and says, can I, can, I just, can I just share something with you about miraculous buildings? And um, they're like, okay. I'm like, yeah, go for it, because I know where this is going, <laughs> you know? They didn't have any power to vote, but they were definitely putting their opinion in there. And, um, and anyway, and it wasn't necessarily all bad. It was where we were at, but still, Pastor Tim says, okay, he says, so... Um, you guys know about my building, but I want to talk about my building. I want to talk about this youth, youth leader who had an outreach center in the streets of Batavia. 
And he says what happened was is they were renting this building, and the, they didn't have any money but to barely just pay for the rent, and it went up for sale. The property was worth just over $100,000, and the landlord offered to him for about $70,000, okay? They went back. They prayed about it. They, they're like, we don't have the money. The landlord's like, okay. Landlord comes back a second time. I'll give it to you for $30,000. They go. They look at their finance. There's just no possible way we can get a loan, right? So um, that goes months. Landlord comes back a few months later. I'll give it to you for $15,000. They're like, $15,000. Well, anyway, he was praying, and he felt led to take a puppy that was just born and sell it. So he put it on eBay for $500, thinking, what's the start? He immediately got calls in from his, or uh, comments in from his friends saying, you realize that this year is the year of the dog or something. Look it up on, in China or Japan or one of those places, something like that. Probably, I'm not sure, probably Japan, but just look it up. You'll see. And certain dogs are worth a lot of money in that year. So we put it up for $15,000, sold it, and bought the building. He said, they don't have anything, but you never know. And guess what happened? Hallelujah. So when I'm near him, I just I get that. You know what I'm saying? So you can't be around Pastor Larry without wanting to pray for people who don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. You know what I'm saying? I'm traveling all through New England. I'm with Pastor Larry in a, getting a snack in between uh, shows or whatever, concerts or whatever, worship services, and we're at the thing, and Larry's getting his food, and he looks up at the cashier, and he says, do you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? She's looking around. She goes, what? He goes, I just... You know, do you know about Jesus? And she, he, she start, he starts preaching the gospel. She gets saved right there. You can't be around Pastor Larry. You can't. The other day I was coming in for a meeting with Pastor Larry and Deb. Deb's like, he's downstairs. He ran into somebody on the way up the stairs. You're going to go down there. There he is. He's down there praying for the dude to get saved. You can't be around Pastor Larry without, it's his anointing. It's his gifting. You're anointed too. Somebody say, I'm anointed too. I've been preaching for like three hours now. And then it says, <laughs> well, praise Jesus, because it's definitely him. Uh, no, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord is the last thing. Okay, now is the season that people can get saved, but there will be a season when the door shuts. You can't get back in. Amen? When I was in college, we were in Carpenter Hall at Roberts Wesleyan College. And the door shut at 1 a.m., and you can't get back in without a security guy. And the security guys took their time to let you in because you were late. No getting in. Game over. The door is shut. After we move into heaven, the door is shut. If we don't know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, it's too late. When Jesus comes back for his second coming, you don't know Jesus as his Lord and Savior. Too late. Now is the acceptable year. This is the time of grace. This is the time when people can get saved. How exciting is that? And you're anointed. And so... I, we went through that list. I said, how many guys know people that are deceived? How many guys know that people are brokenhearted? How many guys know that people that are spiritually poor? Brings us right back to where we started. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. They were plentiful with Jesus, and they're plentiful now. Amen? So why is baptism of the Holy Spirit so important? The Spirit of God coming down upon you? So that you can be filled with power and anointing to do the things that God has called you to do. Amen? So I want to encourage you guys today. First of all, if you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, pray in the Spirit. Amen? Be confident in God. Right? Bring people to church. Amen? I started preaching Lord of the Harvest the church started getting less and less. I think it's just because people were busy with summer, and that's fine because it happens. But the seats should start getting filled up. We should be 